ruby solitaire nestled with two other rings, as, with hands just beginning to freckle and crepe, she wiped away the boy's tears. She tidied the children's hair and clothes, addressing each again by name but working quickly, keeping an eye on the dwindling line of passengers. All right now, she said, wiping the drool from the baby's mouth as the last passengers disembarked. Go wash your hands, just as we practiced. Already the Nazi border guard was mounting the stairs. Go on, go quickly now, but take your time washing up, Truce said calmly. To the girl, she said, Keep your brothers in the lavatory, sweetheart. Until you put back on your gloves, Tante Truce, the girl said. It was necessary that Truce not seem to be hiding the children, yet nor did she want them too close for this negotiation. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen she thought, unconsciously putting the ruby to her lips, like a kiss. She opened her pocketbook, a more delicate thing than she would have carried had she known she'd be returning to Amsterdam with three children in tow. She fumbled inside it, removing her rings as the children, now behind her, traipsed away down the aisle. Ahead, the border guard appeared. He was a young man, but not so young that he might not be married, might not have children of his own. Visas? You have visas to leave Germany? he demanded of Truce, the sole adult remaining in the carriage. Truce continued rooting in her bag as if to extract the required papers. Children can be such a handful, can't they? She replied warmly as she fingered her single Dutch passport still in the handbag. You have children, officer? The guard offered an unsanctioned hint of a smile. My wife. She's expecting our first child, perhaps on Christmas Day. How fortunate for you, Truce said smiling at her own good fortune as the guard glanced toward the sounds of water running in a sink, the children chattering as sweetly as bramble finches. She let the thought sit with him. He would soon have a baby not unlike little Alexei, who would grow into a child like Israel, or dear, dear Sarah. Therese fingered the ruby, sparkling and warm, on the lone ring she now wore. You have something special for your wife to mark the occasion, I'm sure. Something special? The Nazi repeated, returning his attention to her. Something beautiful to wear every day, to remember a most special moment. She removed the ring, saying, My father gave this to my mother the day I was born. Her pale, steady fingers offered the ruby ring, along with her single passport. He took the passport alone, examined it, and glanced again to the back of the carriage. These are your children? Dutch children could be included on their parents' passports but hers listed none. She turned the ruby to catch the light, saying, They are more precious than anything, children. Boy Meets Girl Stefan burst out the doors and down the snow-covered steps, his satchel thwacking at his school blazer as he sprinted for the Burg Theater. At the stationery store, he pulled up short. The typewriter was still there, in the window display. He pushed his glasses up on his nose, put his finger to the window glass and pretended to type. He ran on, weaving his way through the Christkindlmarkt crowds, the smells of sweet mulled Glühwein and gingerbread, saying, Sorry, 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 and keeping his cap low to avoid recognition. They were fine people, his family. Their wealth came from their own chocolate business, established with their own capital, and they kept their accounts always on the credit side at the Rothschild Bank. If it got back to his father that he'd knocked down another old lady on the street, that typewriter would remain nearer the light-strung pine tree here in the Rathausplatz than the one in the winter gallery at home. He waved to the old man tending the newsstand. Good afternoon, Herr Klein. Where is your overcoat, Master Stefan? The old man called after him. Stefan glanced down. He'd left his coat at school again, but he slowed only when he reached the Ringstrasse, where a Nazi pop-up protest blocked the way. He ducked into a poster-plastered kiosk and clanged down the metal stairs into the darkness of the Vienna underworld to emerge on the Burg Theater side of the street. He bolted through the theater doors and took the stairs by twos down to the basement barbershop. Master Neumann, what a great surprise, Herr Perger said, raising white eyebrows over spectacles as round and black as Stefan's, if less snow splattered. The barber was bent low, sweeping the last of the day's hair clippings into a dustpan. But didn't I...